Welcome to Bevy 0.12, which honestly has so much in it, I'm not going to be able to cover all of the little things in this video. Let's start off with a big thing, Bevy Asset V2. Bevy Asset V2 is a complete overhaul of the asset system. And amazingly, you probably won't even need to make any changes to take advantage of it. There's a lot to love in Assets V2, but the biggest feature you'll notice is asset pre-processing. Enabling asset pre-processing will cause Bevy to look for assets not in the default assets folder, but rather a new imported assets folder. This allows the asset processor the chance to optimize or modify files, and it integrates very smoothly with hot reloading. Enabling pre-processing is a matter of just setting the right config option in the asset plugin, but most notably, while Assets V2 is exciting and pre-processing specifically will be the default recommendation in the future, there are reasons you might not want to enable it today. Basically, this boils down to Assets V2 is new, and in some ways, it needs to be adopted further before we're able to see the full benefits realized. From Assets, let's make our way towards the rendering improvements by going through the Bevy UI. Similar to the way that you've defined shaders in the past, there's now a UI material for UI-based shaders. This works very similarly to the Material API, or if you've already used the Material Extension API. And as you can see on the right here, it allows you to, for example, write a fragment shader that draws a circle inside of the Bevy UI system. We also get a new Material node bundle instead of just the node bundle, which can accept this new shader material. And on the left, you can see the impact of this. It's just a sphere that changes color. This is very, very, very cool. And I think this will take Bevy UI's visuals, at least, to the next level. Bevy's rendering approach continues to advance, and it's my personal favorite subsets of the whole Bevy feature set. There are a whole bunch of performance improvements in this release, as well as a general move from CPU-driven rendering to GPU-driven rendering. The TLDR here is that CPU-driven rendering means writing Rust to set up draw calls, while GPU-driven rendering is more about compute shaders handling that kind of thing more. This reduces the amount of rebinding data necessary, which in turn improves performance and enables further work. Nowhere is this more apparent in this release than the automatic batching and instancing of draw commands. The effort to move from CPU to GPU is ongoing, and this is some of the fruit it's yielding. The performance improvements here look really impressive, and it's really exciting to see the continued improvement of the rendering environment. The shader module system also gets another update. This time, it's the import syntax. It's been changed to basically be exactly like Rust. This is great because it means one less thing to learn, and in general should already be familiar to Rust developers. Here you can see the Bevy PBR module, if you will, the submodules, and then the potential individual items. This allows the nesting of imports, so you no longer have 20 lines of individual lines of imports. And as you can see here, it also interacts well with the shader def system. The wireframe implementation in Bevy now uses the material abstraction that was introduced in 0.8. This means it's now possible to change the color of wireframes as well as disable wireframes per mesh. From the high level material abstraction to some low level bind groups, honestly, creating bind groups is a pain. That's just the truth of it. Every time I show someone interested in shaders, the boilerplate code required to work with web GPU APIs, it doesn't really go well. This is why I'm super excited to see Bevy continually investing in abstractions like the material trait. These high level abstractions are really useful, especially for beginners. And now even low level code that creates bind groups by hand, there are a new set of APIs to help reduce the boilerplate and make it easier to work with. Here we've got the previous bind group entry setups that you would need to set up if you were creating a bind group. And there are a couple new APIs sequential and with indexes that kind of get rid of this boilerplate. Going back up to something a little bit higher level, Bevy has historically used what's called a forward renderer. Before I saw deferred rendering in Bevy, I didn't know what forward or deferred rendering were. So practically, I think of the difference between forward rendering and deferred rendering as being pass related. Forward rendering tends to use one pass and deferred rendering uses a series of pre-passes to build up a buffer that is then executed in a final pass. But then Bevy is also kind of hybrid since it includes support for various pre-processes already. So what's the benefit of a deferred renderer? Basically, the answer is lighting performance. And if you dig into the deferred renderer PR, you'll see that the original motivation was a global illumination project. The big note for us users is that we can now write shaders that target forward rendering, forward rendering in pre-passes, or deferred rendering per material, and all of them will work in the same app. I've dug into the deferred renderer PR and wrote a bit of shader code with it already, but I've got some more to do, so I'm gonna leave that deeper dive for another video. Bevy's overall recommendation is that you use forward rendering by default unless you need deferred for some reason. And there's still more rendering. Light transmission is available in standard materials and is super easy to explain actually, as long as we have this visual. We can now render light passing through objects that have the standard material applied. Here's a bunch of spheres, some wax with the new values applied in different formats. 
Think of frosted glass, water, marbles, wax, you name it, and it's now available for you to implement. You can see a number of new properties on the left, specular transmission, index of refraction, thickness, etc., as well as some new features in the material API, such as reads, view, transmission, texture, in case you want to write your own shaders with this. One of my absolutely new favorite features is the material extension trait. I'm using it here in the top left to power an updated version of my dissolve shader that I've shown on the channel before. And on the bottom left, we have the example in the bevy repo, which shows off kind of a tune shading of the light as it hits the sphere. These shaders use the new material extension trait to extend the standard material, which allows the use of textures in normal maps while allowing me to focus on writing the additional code that handles the dissolve effect on top. Previously extending the standard material re previously extending the standard material required a ton of copy and pasting from the standard material implementation in Bevy, which was a super pain to maintain. So I'm very hyped for this one. If you're familiar with working with materials in general, this should look fairly familiar to you. We'll have a material plugin with the extended material, which is now parameterized by the standard material that you're extending, as well as your extension. This gets spawned in via material mesh bundle as usual, and we get to add the materials both with the standard material as the base, and then our extension with, in this case, quantized steps, because we're looking at the bottom left code. This is handled exactly the same way as you would be used to if you were writing a regular material, except now we're using material extension. So we've got a fragment shader and a deferred fragment shader for running in both forward rendering and deferred rendering. And when we look at the shader that powers this sphere in the bottom left, we can see our binding coming in here with just the quantized steps. So how do we access the base? In this case, we've got PBR input, which comes from this PBR input from standard material function. And then we have access to, you know, all of the base colors and other things that are coming in from that standard material struct. There are a number of different functions we can use. If we're in the deferred phase, we can create the deferred output from the PBR input. We can apply PBR lighting. We can change the color in the meantime, and then we can apply the post-pass lighting processing. If you've seen the standard material extensions before, this used to be a giant copy of all of the code in the standard material shader, so this is significantly nicer. And of course, the material extension API is a trait that you can implement that looks very similar to the material trait. You get the option for vertex and fragment shaders, pre-pass vertex and fragment shaders, or deferred mode vertex and fragment shaders. And now a small ECS update. Normally, systems in Bevy run once per frame as part of a schedule. This is how you update components and perform any logic normally. So if you've worked with Bevy before, you've seen this in action. But now we can write systems that run once. This is going to be great for creating button click callbacks, I can already tell. And one-shot systems can be created and stored in resources and called later on demand. There's a new one-shot systems example in the Bevy repo that shows off this functionality. In this case, we've got world.run system once that is running this count entity system. And this system is a full system. It can query, it can interact with the world in every way that you're used to, except for currently a couple of drawbacks around mutation. So looking forward to this getting expanded in future iterations of Bevy, but very excited that it exists today. Something that I always love seeing improved is Bevy's access kit and accessibility improvements, because, you know, I love making things, and if people can't use them, then they will never get to experience them. So I'm happy to see Bevy's access kit integration, which seems to be the standard for accessibility in the Rust ecosystem for UI libraries, improving. And now Bevy works on Android, so if you were waiting for some reason to deploy Bevy to your Android device, now the biggest show-stopping bug has been removed. HSL methods got added to colors, which allow you to modify the hue, saturation, and lightness of a color. And the final piece I'm going to mention is there is reduced tracing overhead. So you can use the tracing library to visualize traces with the Tracy tool. And if you haven't done this before, suffice it to say this is just now better. So normally I'd say that's it and enjoy your weekend, but you know... There's a lot of stuff that I was not able to get to in this video. There's a lot of stuff that we'll cover in the coming weeks. And if you have any particular concerns or desires for what Bevy is doing, go check out the blog post. Basically, everything is in here. It is massive, as you can see. I don't know if you can see the side scroll on the right-hand side here. <laughs> and as always, there's some little update about what they think is going to end up in 0 0.13. I won't cover that here, but go read it if you're looking for what's coming in the future. And I'll see you in the coming week with more Bevy videos. Have a great rest of your day.